You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello, please let me see your ticket stubs for the Double Edge Double Bill. Tonight, Arnold Schwarzenegger hopes you don't recall Junior. Uh, uh. Each week, Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to discuss the randomly selected yin and yang of a double feature. Then, both will have to pick a number between 1 and 10 in order to seal their fates for the next episode. One will have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Let the chaos begin. And you think this is the real Thomas Mariani? It is. Call me off guard with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, Bob, what the fuck? No, and I am uh, Adam Thomas. Where should I be? I am. <laughs> we should be like Total Recall and just start in the first five seconds with Arnold noises. <laughs> yeah, it's like, no! <laughs> it's like really quick. We'll get into that with that movie. <laughs> Don't really... forget to have your eyes bulge. Oh shit, who's there? Who's coming from the rafters over here? Uh, Sans arms, because he's going to the party, Richter. It is James Rodriguez returning to the show. James, how's it going? I'm alright guys, I'll be with you in a moment, I'm just organising my Star Wars figures. I mean, I've got my Chewbacca here. Put the Wookiee down! No! That's a, a long way for that one, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. You walked, that. A, you walked around the park, you walked through England, and then came back for that fucking joke. But no, it's it's, it's fine. We're, we're, we're always glad to have you, James. Anyway, let, let's all get... Right, all right. Yes, let's get to our subject of the evening, which, um, in honor of a new Terminator movie, uh, just came out, uh, Terminator Dark Fate, which I don't, it's out as of when we're talking about this, but I don't know if anyone's seen it yet here, right? No? No. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> uh, well, um, we're, we're doing Arnold Schwarzenegger, who, from what I hear, has more of a supporting turn in the new Terminator, which is probably for the best at this point, uh, but at the same time, um, I know... Adam and I definitely grew up as Arnold fans, especially. He was an international icon, of course, as an action star in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but uh, especially in America, he was just, like, all over the place. And Adam, of course, you were um, a more cognizant during his whole rise, correct? Oh, yeah, man, absolutely. Like, Terminator, you know, Red Heat, all of those. I grew up just loving Arnold Schwarzenegger. Conan, for God's sakes. I mean... Yeah, man. I'm an Arnold kid. Do you remember the first one that you saw? The first Arnold movie I saw was probably Conan. It might have been Terminator, but I want to say it was Conan. Yeah, admittingly, even though I came, I'm a bit younger than you, um, I definitely was exposed to a lot of these Arnold movies from my dad. We talked about this when we did our Sylvester Stallone episode like about a month or so ago. While he was sort of somebody I didn't watch as much of i loved arnold Schwarzenegger. i still remember i think the first one i saw was kindergarten cop because my dad was like oh this is like a good entry level one you can watch this and uh let's immediately go to terminator 2 which even though a lot of kids love terminator 2 it is like horrific especially i remember the bit where arnold takes off his arm and has this like bloody exoskeleton like really <laughs> terrifying me as a child it was really yeah. disturbing to me <laughs> that's horrifying dude. yeah i want you to listen to me very carefully like, oh my god, no! <laughs> I crapped myself. Yes, but uh, James, even though, uh, in case someone couldn't tell by uh, that very subtle accent, uh, you are from England. <laughs> was was Arnold as big of like an icon in, in England there? Was was he such a, a big, beloved thing as he was in the States and obviously his native Austria and other places? Oh, easily. He was the exact example of st A-list star who could... Even over here, just open a movie and it's Arnie on it, doesn't matter what it is. Oh my god, it's an Arnie film, we have to see it. And a lot of my early memories were sitting down with my mum to watch 
whatever film was on TV. We had four channels, so we weren't picky. And a lot of them were Arnie films. And yes, we did watch Terminator 2, True Lies, Last Action Hero. But I did very much grow up watching quite a bit of Arnie. So he is quite a bit of part of my initial film watching experience. And I think we can agree that uh, the two films we're talking about today, which if you're new, uh, we picked two movies at the end of our last episode randomly, uh, because I had two good Arnold movies and Adam had two bad ones, and we ended up randomly selecting um, the good and bad feature, which we'll also be doing for next episode at the end of this one, so stay tuned for that. Um, And uh, I ended up with uh, the good pick of Total Recall from 1990, and Adam ended up with the bad pick of Junior. Um, which, so that's 1990 to 1994. I would argue that is like peak Schwarzenegger time, right? Yeah, no, definitely. Between, I, but I want to say between those four years, because as you and I have talked about, and we even mentioned pre-show, post-junior is a pretty rapid decline, I would say. And even like, obviously in the 80s, he had plenty of uh, movies that were, you know, successful. Like, interestingly, we've covered Arnold Schwarzenegger before where we've done, um, The Running Man. Love. Right, and that was in the 80s, and we've also done End of Days, which is part of that post-junior, pre-governor phase uh, of his career. Um, you, you can definitely tell, like, there was a definite incline, like, the 80s was starting to build up his status, but from 1990 to 1994, you have, and I'm like looking at his filmography right here, you've got, obviously, Total Recall, which we'll talk about in a second, um, but also Kindergarten Cop, Terminator 2... And then Last Action Hero is like the start of the sort of decline because that was a pretty big infamous bomb. But then True Lies. And then I think Junior really is like the start of the death <laughs> tones that would keep on going from there. But we'll talk about all that in a minute. So uh, but first let's start with our good feature. Then let's start with Total Recall. Welcome to Mars. You got a lot of nerve showing your face around here. Look who's talking. You erased your identity and implanted a new one. If I'm not me, who the hell am I? We hope you enjoyed the ride. So, uh, Total Recall came out, as I mentioned, 1990, June 1st, 1990, and uh, was directed by Paul Verhoeven. Uh, this is our first Paul Verhoeven movie on the show, which uh, we should definitely rectify that more. What? Definitely... I know, yeah. Ooh. Is it? Yeah. Oh, it is. We've talked about Verhoeven elsewhere before. Yeah, right, that's... We, we, we never on this show. We should definitely devote an episode to Verhoeven. If oh, else, fucking A, you're right. If nothing else, just to discuss Showgirls. <laughs> um, yeah, but... and I could always talk about Robocop again, anytime. Oh, of course, of course, yeah. And he's got a new movie coming out next year. It's a non-sploitation movie in 2020. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that'll be quite fun. Uh, but Total Recall, um, which is based on a story by Philip K. Dick and uh, was written by Ron Schuessler, Gary Goldman, and Dan O'Bannon, who um, previously had written stuff like Alien and um, Return of the Living Dead. He directed, along with writing, a uh, great sci-fi writer. Like, there were so many people trying to develop the story for years, and uh, the last big director before Verhoeven got on, who developed a lot of the look and stuff, was uh, Mr. David Cronenberg, which, uh, given the look of some of these creatures and stuff, uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I could see that. It's quite horrific, a lot of it. <laughs> that makes sense. Right, and he wanted to originally make it more of like a grounded sci-fi thriller kind of story. And his ideal, actually, for the main character of Quaid was actually going to be William Hurt. Now, Adam, I know you're a big William Hurt fan. Would you have wanted to see sort of the Cronenberg-Hurt collaboration for A Total Recall? Yeah, you know, and I I think it would have really worked because there is... Let's just get into it, baby. There is not one second when you look at, suppose, not spy Quaid, I don't think this guy could still just kick the living shit out of everybody in this room. No, he's a humble construction worker, Adam. He <laughs> yeah, right. to fly. <laughs> he's a giant beefcake. But if you get a guy like William Hurt, that would be really cool to have the switch and have him all of a sudden just be a total badass from just a normal, unassuming looking guy. Now, I, again, I, I do love this movie, but that is one of the problems I, I actually do have with it. I, I do think he's sort of miscast. Well, I think what, what Verhoeven's trying to do with this, which he obviously does a lot in his other movies, I think uh, 
the Screen Junkies Honest trailer for Total Recall that came out like a couple weeks ago said it best that he's the king of having his cake and eating it too. Um, in terms of his filmography, it's it's pretty valid. Especially in this case, it feels like he's both like doing obviously like a very over the top action movie starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, but also kind of commenting on especially American. 80s action cinema of around that time, where with how ridiculous the gore is in this movie, which we'll talk about, because Jesus fucking Christ, <laughs> I forgot the escalator scene in particular, <laughs> how ridiculous that is. Um, but I think it's, it, it feels like he's kind of commenting on like sort of that balance of unreality. It just adds to a lot of the the theories, or just like a compounding about like is the action post like him going to recall real or not? I think it just adds to that because it's just like, even from the start you have him as like this big beefy muscular dude. So it's just like, maybe it isn't actually a dream. It isn't real. We'll probably talk about that more and more as it goes along. But how do you feel about that, James? That question of is Arnold miscast? Well, I think when you cast Arnold, you have a certain idea of what his character is going to be. He's going to be the muscular badass. He's going to be able to kick a room full of people's asses without even breaking a sweat. So when he's meant to be this unassuming guy, it is a bit, now hang on a minute, but with the whole thing of it being post-recall, is it real? Is it a fantasy? I like to think that it could also be a way of playing against expectations. So you're thinking, oh, well, he is the muscular badass. It must be real. But what if it isn't? What if he's just a big, gentle construction worker with big dreams? And personally, I think he is believable as that. But I think that's more down to his performance than his physique, obviously. When it comes to playing into the secret agent type, the throwing a disembodied head at people... uh, waiting for it to explode and shooting up a room full of people, he sells it because that's what he's done for a decade. Yeah, he really sells the sincerity, which is something that's underrated, I think, about Arnold as an actual actor because it, people more concerned, like, oh, he's like a big action hero. He doesn't really act that much. But Arnold, I think, sells so many of these movies, especially when he's not playing like a Terminator character, off his sincerity, off his genuineness. Mm. And I think he really does, I agree, sell that in the pre-sort of recall moments of this movie where he seems like just so desperate but eager to have this fantasy in his life like especially when the president of recall like has him in the meeting he's just talking about like well here's the whole package here's this he's just like what about the 12 dollar package like he's really excited about like learning more about the stupid fucking deal i just i I love that it's like he, he feels like somebody who almost like given his you know obviously immigrant nature just came off the boat and he's just super eager to live the american life almost i i think that that's that adds i think to maybe it's not his, i agree his most physically appropriate um casting but i think he sells the eagerness and the joy and also the confusion once everything just goes crazy oh definitely that bit after he first kills the people and he just has a moment where he's like jesus christ what have i done that feels real feels like he's suddenly been thrust into this bay of bloody violence, which even he is shocked by. Not for very long, though. He's not shocked for very <laughs> long by it. Because he just sort of straight up brutally murders everyone in this movie. Uh, and to get back on the uh, the secret agent thing, he would be the most, like, just the worst decision to make this guy a secret agent. Like, no one's going to notice this guy. <laughs> This giant six foot five, you know, 250 pound of muscle Austrian guy. Yeah, he blends right in. I would argue that's more of a problem, like, say, a true lies, where that one's trying to be more of like, oh, this is is in the world that you know, people in the audience. This is totally realistic. It's like, sure, dude. As opposed to this, like, weird sci fi realm. Yeah, I'll give you that. I mean, I guess we have Quato, so I guess I can believe it. Um, but I think for all these reasons, I would argue strongly, and a big reason why I chose this um, as one of my good picks, was I would consider this, like, the ultimate Arnold movie. It's no offense to, like, the first two Terminators are very close to me for that, but I consider Total Recall sort of, like, the absolute zenith of, like, what an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie is. Like, if I if I just, like, met some person who's like, I never watched any of those Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, like, what's the best one? Or what's the one that encapsulates a lot of, like, what Arnold is as an action hero and his appeal? It's this movie for me. I think because it has, like, all the over-the-top, like, noises, like we talked about. In the first, like, 30 <laughs> seconds of this movie, 
he starts making the classic Arnold noise. Because he's like choking on Mars the first fucking 30 seconds of this movie. Uh, but then from there, it just has a lot of like his, like we mentioned, his eagerness, his sort of naivete, but then also his quippiness. Some of the best Arnold lines are in this movie. Just some of like the best sort of him interacting with something for a comedic purpose. Like I remember as a young kid when I watched this and was, you know, when I wasn't being horrified by the violence, I was really just engaged with this sci-fi world and Arnold acting off of it, particularly with all the stuff with like the Johnny Cab, which is amazing to me. I love him interacting off this stupid fucking animatronic Disneyland robot uh, played by Robert Picardo and modeled after him. Um, and it's tremendous. That was when I was a kid, the moment I got hooked into this movie really hard. Well, I don't think it's a bad choice to say this is like the ultimate Arnold movie. And for someone who's never seen any of them, this this would be in my top three to recommend, like, the best of the Arnold, you know, between the 80s mm. and the early 90s. Uh, I, I I still go Predator as my all-time favorite based on just 80s macho machismo Arnold. But uh, this is definitely up there. I'd say this, Terminator, and, and Predator are probably his finest three. Not to discredit, you know, Terminator 2 or any of the other ones we mentioned. Yeah, by the way, fuck Johnny Cat. That thing's terrifying. But, um... <laughs> it, was, it was freaky as hell. I'm kind of shocked it was a real person, to be honest. Well, no, I mean, it's an animatronic, but it's, like, it's voiced by and modeled after Robert Picardo. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not actually Robert, that would be even more terrifying. That's what Robert Picardo looks like. But that would also be the greatest practical effects makeup of all time. <laughs> No, I, I definitely think as far as off the wall fucking Arnold movies, because this movie is when you really boil it down, it's really complex and it's also batshit crazy and violent. So no, I, I absolutely was ecstatic when this was the one that came up for your good pick. I, I feel like this is an often fondly remembered one, but not an often talked about as far as Arnold classics. Right, because a lot of the other ones you can kind of boil down to, like, the moments that people remember, like, you know, when a predator, like, get to the chopper, all the classic lines. And this one has that, but also a lot more of, like, this weird, interesting existential questions about, like, what do we perceive to be reality, and it, when we're in the moment, do we really think that, like, these big, over-the-top moments that happen in our lives, like, are a dream or a reality, but also it's just, like, really fucking fun. And I think it also is a big testament to, like, a great supporting cast all around Arnold, even down to... Early on, I forgot that I think him and Sharon Stone have way more chemistry <laughs> than uh, Arnold does with the eventual main lead of um, <laughs> Rachel Ticotin, I believe. I apologize if I mispronounced that. Yeah, I, I was especially surprised by like, oh, wow, they have like a genuine chemistry, which makes it so much more upsetting where it's like, oh, no, this is all actually a facade. And uh, Michael Ironside is literally getting cucked. I'm sorry, but that's literally what he's doing. He's letting <laughs> Arnold fuck his wife and watching it. That's what it is. No, that's very true. Michael Ironside's whole drive to kill Arnold is pretty much because he knows his wife got it so good from Arnold that he can never measure <laughs> up now. He's just a jealous little cuckold. Well, I mean, yes, he should be. Look at Arnold, for God's sake. <laughs> oh, yeah. How dare you besmirch Michael Ironside like that? What a hot <laughs> snack our Michael <laughs> Ironside is. Oh, yeah. Am I forever? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but that's another thing I want to address too. The villains in this movie, uh, mainly Michael Ironside and uh, Dick Jones. Ronnie fucking Cox, yes. Yeah, I know. I can't never remember his goddamn name. No, they're just so good in this. I kind of am a pretty big Michael Ironside fan. He's in a lot of garbage, but I'll be damned if he's not usually committed 100%. And yeah. he's really good at this. And the thing is, he's got like the Lance Henriksen quality where they can play a heavy and a tough guy against guys who could obviously kick the shit out of them, but you never really like disbelieve it. There's no question if if Michael Ironside and Arnold Schwarzenegger came to blows in this movie, who's going to win? If it's anything like this movie, he could get some crotch shots in because Arnold's <laughs> crotch gets like mutilated in this movie. Dude, <laughs> it's just by the end of it, it probably looked like Dean Norris's face. <laughs> it's like a butcher shop window display by the time people are done with it. It's just beaten red. And he makes that great face, the the ultimate face of just like, oh, I've just been hitting the genitals <laughs> every time, um, and it works so well. And that face even translates to when we get the weird prosthetic versions of Arnold, like when he's getting that track right of his nose cavity. 
which is one of my favorite things. Um, and the effects are so impressive in this movie and still really hold up. And it's one of like the last times where it was like that twilight point where like practical effects were still so large, but you see the first few digital effects, like the whole x-ray thing is all like a digital effect. So it's like it's a, one of the few examples like at this sort of time where it was like a great meld, even down to another Arnold animatronic when he gets his disguise revealed in the train station, which is so <laughs> great. That weird, creepy fucking Arnold face. I know. Uh, and speaking of the X-ray scene, even though you know it's dated, but it still kind of holds up. It still works really well, especially in the context of the film. By the way, when that the redhead lady, Arnold's disguise or whatever, starts shitting the bed and freaking out. She's absolutely terrifying. Yeah, because at that point you don't know it's Arnold. You just wonder why is she saying two weeks over again and again. Well, because it's weird because like she looks like she's having some kind of seizure, and you're like, what the fuck's happening at this point? And then of course Arnold reveals himself and is still wearing that dress, which is that's all you need out of Arnold in a dress, considering the next movie we're going to talk about. Um, that's like the funniest <laughs> version of him in a dress possible. But yeah, I, I want to ask, so James, what is your favorite sort of like effects mm. moment in this movie that we may have not have mentioned? Oh, it's easily Quato. I think I was saying it right, Quato? Yes. Even though they yes. do say a weird, like, I do love, there's a point where like most people say Quato like that, but then there's a point where Michael Ironside goes up and like, oh, what's this graffiti over here? It's a Quato. Like, <laughs> like they, don't, they, don't know, they don't know how it's fucking pronounced. It's like a, a, almost another like subtle layer of like, these guys are so ignorant to the culture on Mars. Uh, but yes, Quato, of course, the resistance leader, which is interesting because he's actually voiced by the guy who is like the full human version of Quato, Marshall Bell, um, who is really great in like both parts, really. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, when Quato's so built up, you think he's going to be some mystical figure, maybe. But when he's revealed, you don't think he's going to be coming out of a guy's stomach. And the way the Rob Bottom's effects have realized him, the right bit of what the fuck. And it looks so phenomenal. It's you can definitely see the link between that and his Rob Bottom's work on the thing. Yeah, because it's authentically disgusting, but also it feels like a real character. Like, the, the Quato character, like, the way that it's manipulated and puppeteered, feels like, oh, th- no, this is totally like a thing on this dude's stomach. I-, I totally believe that. To the point where you kind of feel sad when he ends up getting murdered by um, <laughs> fucking Benny. Uh, which, I love Benny, too. Uh, but do you agree? I think I really believe so much of like that character and you end up believing kind of like the resistance at the same time because that effect sells itself so well. It's a great example of using, um, you know, authentic practical effects magic to sell the world. I agree a hundred percent about Quato. It's also my favorite practical effect. It, it's, he's so disgusting to look at, but you can't like look away and it's a really great performance vocally. I'm not going to lie. I know it sounds terrible, but when he fucking takes one to the, his little tiny, head i thought it was hilarious as a child (laughs) i thought it was so funny to the point to where it became like almost an inside joke between me and my brother about quato getting shot in the head because it just cracks me up that not only does he shoot quato in the head he's also shooting this fucking guy right in his stomach tumor like it's just it's fucking wild how crazy how could that thing be the head of the fucking resistance? Like, I just don't understand. Who's going to take orders from that thing? No, we need an uprising. What the fuck are you? Like, that's exactly what would happen. I would love to see a resistance meeting that just starts with, like, so first order on the agenda that I've passed out to all of you in this packet. It's written in crayons, the R's are backwards and shit. <laughs> I mean, he's got a lot of good points, even though, like, you can tell. Look at this picture of a house that he made with the stick figure. It says right. everything about our struggles. Start revolt, 315, 415, carrots and apple juice. What? <laughs> but I think it's part of what James was talking about, where, like, you're sold by just the idea of, like, Quado seems like it would be, like, some sort of, um, you know, mystical, like, or like a big domineering figure, like an Arnold almost. And then it's like, oh no, it's something completely deceptive. It's the Yoda principle, as one may call it. Like I just coined right now. Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go, the Yoda principle. I like that. We're going to stick with that. Uh, <laughs> no, it is, but I don't see Quato doing flips with a lightsaber. Either. 
<laughs> well, you know, they originally did it until the prequels. Yeah, I like, don't I see Clado needing a walking stick or stealing candy from a robot. He doesn't even have his own body. How is he going to do flips? <laughs> he's not going to do anything. That might be even better, though, if Marshall Bell is, like, doing flips <laughs> while the quadruple stomach thing is a light yes. Well, all you have to do is get it a little bit bigger than a waiting pool to end it. Just get to, like, five feet of wire. <laughs> That's it. Quaddo's done for. <laughs> okay, we're talking a lot about Quaddo, but I wanted to bring up another effects moment we kind of teased earlier, and it's not nearly as elaborate as a Quaddo, but I think it's just so perfectly just embodies a lot of, like, what I love about Paul Verhoeven as a director in particular is the previously mentioned Escalator sequence with the one guy who has maybe the most squibs on them of any person ever, <laughs> and just how ridiculous the fucking gore continues to be, even after, like, he's been shot, like, the first round of times, and figured, like, oh, okay, like, most blood is, like, just draining out of him. It's like, nope, he still has a lot of blood left. <laughs> it's, it just gets so ridiculous, but in such a in really engaging, fun way, where when you're watching it, you don't really question what's going on at that same time. Because it's just like, this is moving too fast. We can't even bother to question how ridiculous this is. It's pure excitement. Now, of course you never question, because you just saw Arnold empty a fucking, like, 300 rounds into one guy who is still just spurting fucking V8 juice all over the place. And, and, and expertly he did it, too. That's the one thing that I love about the Arnold movies, and, and probably this one in particular. You never, like, no, come on, that wouldn't happen. Or that's not realistic. Or uh. No, it's just so fun. Purely entertainment. I mean, now, don't get me wrong. Commando's a little different story where you're like, this guy stormed an entire compound with, like, one machine gun and a shotgun. And a sleepless still, fucking vest. <laughs> he pulled up on an inflatable raft in a Speedo. Um, <laughs> it's so stupid. No, you ne- you're right. You never stop to question. You never, you never, like, wait a minute. Let's pause this and really think about this. No, who gives a shit? You're along for the ride. This movie is a complete ride, as are most uh, Verhoeven action movies. Like, just sit back and enjoy it, for God's sakes. But it still allows you to think and ruminate and question things at the same time. Sure. He's like the best of both worlds. He gives you food for your thought, but he also gives you bloody visuals to satisfy that inner animal you have. Yeah. Would you say this is your favorite Verhoeven film, James? No, I have a lot of love for RoboCop. That's the correct answer. You answered correctly. You passed the test. I'd buy that for a yeah. dollar. Yeah, RoboCop's the best. Right, because this is a great movie. RoboCop is a perfect movie. Like, a, an absolute perfect yeah. visage of what it needs to be. As opposed to um, a, a Total Recall, like, I would say the only real issue I do have with it, I don't think it's the actress's fault, but the Molina character, I do think, is, like, one of the more underdeveloped examples of an Arnold Schwarzenegger um, love interest. Immediately, that's always the weakest part of these movies to me. Just because, yeah. like, they feel so oh, yeah. thrown in so much of the time. It's just like, oh, are they going to be, like, a character? No? Okay. That's why, like, the best Arnold, like, female characters are, like, a Sarah Connor. Who's like, oh, she's actually a character who doesn't have to shack up with Arnold. Great. Awesome. The main girl in this is completely interchangeable with the main girl from Running Man. I swear to God, I thought they were the same fucking actress. For, like, ever. Like, well, that's because you're a racist, just... but anyway... <laughs> Oh, hey, man. Hey. <laughs> tisk, yeah. tisk, tisk. Well, they are similar looking. They're both Latina women with dark girl, curly hair, which, by the way, Arnold clearly has a personal type, which he goes for in these films. Um, As evidenced by the great moment when he's in Recall where they're like, well, what do you prefer, blondes, brunettes, brunettes? I love that bit. <laughs> it's uh, one of my favorite Arnold-like want, deliveries. Do you want curvy? Do you want an athletic... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please leave the room. Yeah, I, the, the, like we said, other than Sarah Connor, most, if not all, the female leads in Arnold Schwarzenegger moves are kind of ho hum and for, ultimately forgettable. Yeah, mainly because of just how they're written, um, for sure. But that still doesn't stop. Like, say, like I, I totally dig Sharon Stone in this movie. I think this is one of her better performances, especially because like she plays on the sensuality but she's also extremely tough. Like, we're talking about, like, her beating the shit out of his crotch. Like, she is a badass in this movie every time she fights off Arnold. And even also plays on the seduction of just, like, oh, don't you want to come back to me? Like, hey, even though everything seems like it's, uh, like, a lie and a false thing, she's like, I still, like, love that D. 
I really want that D again. <laughs> Especially in another great scene in this movie, the whole thing where the one guy comes in with the red pill, which, interesting, feels kind of influential to a certain movie starring Keanu Reeves about nine years after this. It it, it feels like we're, we're really just playing a lot on, on so much of like, oh, hey, is this reality? Is this fiction? And the actors do a great job of selling all that. I guess also, t- to with that... Do you guys think by the end that this was all a dream or not? I go for the it's all a dream thing. I don't know. Maybe I just like the more depressing ending where Arnie's got the lobotomy rather than the happy ending. But it's just the way it all plays out as he's, Arnie has sold it, complete with the blue skies in on Mars. It feels too clean cut to be reality. But here's the thing. If it is all a dream inside his head how much does he hate his wife if that's how he imagines her probably a lot it's gonna be really awkward when he goes back to like have dinner he's like oh so you went to recall how was your trip Uh... yeah i I firmly believe he, he as far as i know i've read parts of the uh the source material as far as i know he had an embolism and this is almost like his last like he's in basically a catatonic state and this is what he's seeing before they pull the plug when he sees the blue skies it's them pulling the plug and it's him dying the recall actually did scramble his brain like they talked about happened with one other person it happens to douglas quaid but do you feel that even in the film adaptation it specifically does that i believe it's completely up for your interpretation if you want the happy arnold ending then you got it and if you want the other ending then that's your choice too um which i think is probably a smart way to play i i can't see uh, you know, an early 90s Arnold movie where he has a fucking embolism and is in a coma at the end. People are going to be like, that movie was great! <laughs> like, and so I get why they did what they did, and I, I think it was the smart play. He didn't get to a space chopper at all. I want my five bucks back. Like, Come on, guys! <laughs> I wanted more jackhammering! Personally, I like the, like James, I like the more downer ending idea, but it works fine if if it is the you know the savior ending like that works totally fine too. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I would side more in that camp of like it's it's up to so much interpretation. And I think it just is more a credit to like the dreamlike weird visuals that you know are displayed here by Verhoeven. I think with like so much of this different stuff, including like we mentioned before, I want to talk just a bit more before we go into final thoughts. Fucking Benny is such a great stupid side character. <laughs> it's so ingenious. Just like, it's this weird part of this machination of Ronnie Cox's plan of like, Oh, Hey, so Arnold is going to have to like realize he's like actually a secret agent. Everything got scrambled. We'll have to go to Mars and befriend this specific taxi driver <laughs> and do all this stuff. But you feel so swept up in it because of the pacing. And also people like Mel Johnson jr. As Benny just really sell that like, Oh yeah, I'm totally on your side. I'm totally with you, man. It's totally going to work. And then when he has that fucking alien arm, it's so cool how it just bends out out of him and shit like that so great people just wanted to believe he wanted to help his five kids or four kids right when i was when i was a kid uh not one of the four or five hated benny he annoyed the shit out of me uh but now as an adult yeah man, I, I can't get enough of that guy i want more benny god damn it uh well i guess we should uh get into our, our final thoughts here we've been going long about uh total recall and we do have another movie to talk about um, so, uh, we'll go ahead and get into final thoughts, but along with your final thoughts, let's definitely say, uh, your favorite Schwarzenegger one-liner in this particular film. So, James, our guest, your final thoughts and the favorite one-liner of Schwarzenegger in Total Recall. Okay, well, I think this is one of the best Arnold films out there, and one of the best examples of why he was such a draw to the box office. It's got the fantastic violence, the... Yes, the one-liners, but it also gives you food for thought on top of that. It's a genuinely fun time, but it's also an engaging narrative which twists throughout the plot and gives you thrilling action beats. I absolutely love it, and it's easy to recommend. Favourite one-liner would have to be, Consider this a divorce. Of course, great bit. Adam? I mean, yeah, I I think this isn't just the classic of both you know, Arnold's filmography and also sci-fi action movies. And it's one of the better, you know, Philip K. Dick based films. Like you already alluded to Thomas. I think if you want to show somebody, 
you know, three or four Arnold movies to really sum up his career. I, I think this absolutely has to be in there. Um, because just, it's really awesome. <laughs> you know, it's, it's fun. It's brutally, brutally violent. It's just pretty well acted all around. It's dirty looking. It's kind of gross. And uh, it's just just a fun ride of a movie. And for my line, I mean, it's got to be, you know, welcome to the party, Richter. I mean, that's one of the best. It's one of the most infinitely quotable. I do like when he kills Ben. He's like, you know, screw you. But, um, yeah, it's got to be welcome to the party, Richter. Uh, it's see you at the party, Richter. Well, shit. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a fake total recall girl. You can't recall that shit. <laughs> well, you know, whatever. And also, uh, well, you know, get you out the miles on a loop. Kind of gets stuck in the old head. Oh, God, we didn't talk about that, but I do love him playing off the video screen of himself. <laughs> so it's good. So good. Fucking wrapped around his head. It's so ridiculous. And even I love also in that when he's playing like the... Um, on the screen version of himself, how it feels like he's totally doing like a theme park, like pre-show video <laughs> acting. Like it's perfectly fits like that kind of aesthetic. It's so silly. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I, I love this movie. It's, it's like I mentioned, I, I would say honestly, outside of those first two Terminator movies, it is my favorite Schwarzenegger movie because of all the things we're mentioning. It has so many of the great lines. It has so many of the great, awesome practical effects things. It's very weird, distinctive. The production design in this movie is phenomenal. The score by Jerry Goldsmith is very underrated, I think, um, right from the beginning of that big credit sequence that goes on. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite. It's Fairhoven movies. It's like right under RoboCop for me in terms of how much. I just have so much fun with this movie. It never feels like it's nearly two-hour length for me and it has i think some of arnold's better examples of like playing his persona for the sake of what's going on in the actual narrative i think it does a great job with with all of that and uh yeah for my favorite line i mean i i quoted it at the beginning in my own way of the you think this is the real quaid it is is like one of my favorite just bits of arnold ever and it's such a great sequence how they keep playing on the holograms and going back and forth between everybody but that's like arnold distilled for me of, like, what I loved about him growing up. That whole sequence is, like, just perfect for me. But, um, if you want something else perfect out there, you could go ahead and listen to this ESO show right now. Where comedy and commentary collide. Thunder Talk brings a unique variety show style twist to the fandom podcast genre. We drop music from some of today's hottest up and coming artists. We discuss topics of social and political relevance and deliver our sideways take on the world at large. If stand up comedy, NPR, the Millennium Falcon, and classic MTV had a baby, it would be Thunder Talk. Thunder Talk is part of the ESO Network. Find us at thundertalk.org and on all podcasting platforms. Now, uh, let's stray away from all this perfection and go to our little bundle of joy of a second feature, our bad pick, Junior. It's impossible, it's not natural, and I'm not interested. We're on the verge of something fantastic, and I need you to carry it through with me. I must be crazy to be doing this. You may be crazy. But you're also pregnant. I'm pregnant. From Universal Pictures and Ivan Reitman comes something inconceivable. Oh, my God. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Danny DeVito, and Emma Thompson, Jr. So, Jr. Uh, came out November 23rd, 1994, directed by Ivan Reitman. And this is the uh, third collaboration between um, Ivan Reitman and Arnold Schwarzenegger, because uh, they had done Twins and Kindergarten Cop previously. Um, and this was part of a phase, definitely, where, like, Arnold was starting to, like, embrace doing comedy, which he wasn't necessarily terrible at, given he had done comedy in some of his earlier movies. And I would argue, especially of those three, Kindergarten Cop is, like, still a pretty solid, like, action comedy kind of angle for Arnold. Because it, it, it weirdly is kind of, like, this trilogy of sorts is Arnold sort of, like, learning to appreciate beings that are smaller than him, and it keeps regressing further. <laughs> with each of these Ivan Reitman movies, where it's like, first Danny DeVito and Twins, then all the children in Kindergarten Cop, and then this baby that Arnold has, because you all know what this movie is. Uh, it's the movie where Arnold Schwarzenegger's pregnant. It's a joke. You've probably heard this movie. You probably haven't seen it, though. 
And um, seeing is believing in the worst. It's so fucking terrible. Adam, this was your choice. Uh, why? <laughs> I think you kind of just nailed that, didn't you? <laughs> I think you just explained why. Uh, because I'm a huge Arnold fan, so if I'm going to pick his bad ones, I'm going to go for the worst. You know, this is one of, like, the four or five Arnold movies that I legitimately think is garbage. Uh, the rest, almost all the rest get a pass from me, but this is just inexcusably bad. Well, and, and James, I know um, we uh, behooved you to watch this, and you had never <laughs> seen Junior before, like so many people out there. Um, and we're sorry, first off. And uh, what were your thoughts on Junior? Uh, where do I begin? I mean, I've heard about this film for ages, and... I consider myself to have a morbid curiosity. So if I hear something's really terrible, I want to go see it. I want to experience it for myself. But I had no interest in seeing Junior. So thanks for that. It sucks. You're welcome, baby. Don't worry about it. No problem. Well, I I think maybe to elaborate on why it sucks necessarily, it's like, so let's just imagine you are tasked with like, Mm -hmm. okay, you are going to make your own Schwarzenegger movie where he's pregnant. It's ostensibly supposed to be a comedy. So it's like, okay, you could go the route of doing a very silly, zany comedy or just something very weird where this is the case where he is pregnant. So you figure you would go in that way of like, let's go for broke, let's go silly, let's do something very zany that might not be a good movie, but at least something that like would resemble something somebody might want to see. Versus the problem with this movie is... You hear, like, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger's prank, it's going to be such a funny comedy. It has, like, a few moments of, like, light humor, but it plays more like a Lifetime movie. It's so maudlin and so overtly, like, sappy about just, like, Arnold really, like, is so invested in this. Even in real life, like, because he mainly wanted to do this justice because his wife, Maria Schreiber, at the time, had gone through, like, some bad pregnancies. So he was like, he wanted to actually treat this with sincerity. And it's an example where, like, Arnold's sort of genuineness and sincerity really hurts the production because it just feels like, why are we so fucking maudlin about this? This is fucking stupid. (laughs) Throw a pie, for God's sake, somebody. But the thing is, in hindsight, too, with that explanation they just gave, you know, his wife, Maria Shriver, in hard pregnancies and whatnot, so he wanted this movie. Clearly, he really didn't give a fuck about her that much in the long run. So (laughs) kind of that's a little ridiculous uh now uh i believe that was his excuse at the time um (laughs) but yeah to be fair if he wanted to do a film as thomas said so lifetime and so maudlin something about the real struggles women go through in pregnancy why not put a woman in the lead and have her um go through this like hey make it emma thompson in the lead she could sell it but it feel you're right it feels like an odd mix with arnold gets pregnant kind of comedy i guess like in theory it's supposed to be like oh it's a man experiencing like that pain of childbirth and all this other stuff but it, it just feels ultimately like we're, we're playing so many of these scenes so sincerely that it feels like you could just rewrite a few things, and it is like a typical pregnancy, like, Lifetime movie. But the the big sin of this movie for me really is what you're talking about with Emma Thompson, because, like, Arnold, as we said, was, like, this is the moment of him starting to, like, go on the outs. This is post-Last Action Hero. This is, like, the beginning of the end for his big blockbuster career. And Danny DeVito, as much as I, you know, we all love Danny DeVito, we'll take a check for, for sure. Yeah, he's kind of, that's mm-hmm. kind of his M.O., dude. Right, but in a very lovable, weird rapscallion way that he does. Right, right. Versus Emma Thompson is, like, especially at this time, this is like the movie she made in between winning her two Oscars. <laughs> like, she had just won for <laughs> Howard's End, and she was about to win the screenplay one for Sense and Sensibility, like, the next year. <laughs> so this is, like, how you waste, like, Emma Thompson in her prime, who is such, like, one of, like, the wittiest, most charming, funny, beautiful women to, like, ever grace the screen at this time. And she plays, like, such a poorly, thinly written klutz of a character. I was going to say, but she's clumsy. Whoa! Look out! 
that was the stuff that offended me the most. And it's the most like overtly comedic stuff in the movie because she's mm. like, oh, it's big elaborate slapstick sequences. And it's like, this is such a waste of such prime fucking talent. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> her characterization is pretty much having cheese on her face. What happens in the movie. She like falls asleep. Like that's one of the few jokes of the movie. She like wakes up like, oh, I've got cheese on my face. <laughs> Hilarious. Wonderful. Most everybody in this movie is kind of wasted. Let's just be honest. This mm -hmm. Arnold, he, I mean, he really tried to get into the, you know, sort of family-friendly fair. And I'd argue Kindergarten Cop's probably his best example of, even though that's not that good of a movie. But it's a wash of a film. I mean, why is Frank Langella in this movie? What the fuck? Wait, what is going on? It, it's just, what? She slept with the roadie from Aerosmith? Come on. <laughs> Nobody looked at his partner from Kindergarten Cop and was like, "Oh yeah, she could probably bang like rock stars on the circuit." Like this, dude, who who wrote this? Who wrote this? Do you want me to pull up the credit? Yeah, um, I'm asking you. Fucking wrote this. Kevin Wade and Chris Conrad. Yeah, well, fuck them. It's a garbage fire of a movie. It's not very funny. The jokes are literally, like we said, slap sticky garbage. And Arnold and, and the fucking drag. Oh, no. You see, in Austria, when I was in Olympic women's decathlete, they gave us steroids. And now the, the, I'm dealing with the repercussions. In your, in your, like, oh, oh, God, I want my Larry. Oh. Like, oh, Jesus Christ. And that's the great example of, like, a scene where, like, Ivan Reitman, like, could have directed that scene as, like, a French farce thing. Because that's the whole thing. Is like, he goes to this women's retreat, dressed up as a lady, and then he goes into labor. And all the women are, like, crowding around his room, just like, oh, we should get our doctor. And he goes, no, I want my Larry, as you're mentioning. And, like, you would figure you would play that more like, oh, this is a comedic farce sequence. But they treat it with, like, all the sincerity of, like, an actual movie where a woman, like, goes into labor and the, like, the dad right. has to fucking come over. And it just feels, like, so ridiculous on its face, but also so flat and lifeless. Like, this also, this movie is mostly shot with, like, one straight light. Like, it's, it's one of the most poorly, blandly lit movies I've ever seen. <laughs> where just every scene feels like a fucking sitcom in the worst way. And Emma Thompson, God bless her. She bangs not eight month pregnant Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> e no. Evan, yes, yes, we. we... God. <laughs> no, why? Good lord! Yeah, I mean, what position did they do? <laughs> <laughs> How did that even work? That's all. It's like two stegosauruses banging. How? <laughs> 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 like it doesn't work. Oh, it's just awful, awful, awful garbage. But I, I, we need to definitely talk about uh, James. You posted this on Twitter, like the, the most horrific <sighs> sequence of this whole movie. Why don't you describe like this dream sequence Arnold has at one point early in the film? Okay, so after Arnold's, shall we say, up to duff, he has a bit of a dream where he's been through labor and this nurse walks in with his child he's handed it and it's a baby with arnold's face imposed upon it and it is going to haunt my nightmares i watched this on october 31st and it was the most frightening thing i had seen it is fucking dreadful and this is framed as a comedy I also didn't mention the part where like the baby actually speaks not too long after birth and just keeps screaming in a pitched up Arnold voice, Mama! Mama! And it's, it is, it's like the worst, like, early CG matting onto this baby's face. This poor baby. I'm glad, like, it's anonymous, given that Arnold's <laughs> face is fucking over it. Um, and it's just this, like, weird moment that feels like it's also, like, to pad time. Like, we didn't mention this either. This movie's, like, nearly two hours long. <laughs> And it so drags every single second. It drags ass so hard. Because it just, like, endlessly explains about, like, this concept. Which, given it's a comedy where you're not laughing, the whole explanation of, like, the expectane, which is, like, the drug that Dane DeVito and Arnold were developing, is going to, like, be implanted into Arnold's, like, lower abdomen somewhere? And the baby's just gonna have a womb there? 
No, no, they imp- they implant the egg and embryo in him, and right. he has to take expect it to prevent miscarriage. That's what it is. Well, then it makes perfect scientific sense. You're right. Yeah, I mean, come on, man. Uh, <laughs> well, Arnold being a scientist makes perfect scientific sense. The biggest laugh I got of this movie is I accidentally started the Spanish version first. <laughs> and to hear a Spanish guy trying to do an Arnold accent, which is real in the Spanish version, this is hilarious. In the opening door, the baby's in the library. He, you know, hola! Hola! He said, Mino, where's Madre? I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> it was the greatest thing ever. Donde es la biblioteca? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> then I started the English one, and all that joy left instantly. And honestly, like that opening sequence just made me realize, like, why didn't you just make a movie where like Arnold has to be in care of a baby? Simple, perfect. That would have worked. Like he's some like big badass guy who has to, like take care of a kid. It's obvious, like it's classic um, pacifier <laughs> humor, or like the mention, like almost kindergarten cop. It's like he has to take care of like an infant himself. That's the way, like, at least more watchable version of this movie. That would have been probably, like, you know, familiar and not that memorable, but at least would have resembled, like, a comedy. Yeah, at the time this came out, too, that would have been gangbusters. Yeah, it's, it's three men in a baby era. That was the highest grossing movie in 1987. I think that's when Arnold's comedic talents work best. It's when his muscular, tough man look is playing off with a naivety or working against young children. It works like that. Something like that would have been better than ha ha, Austrian man pregnant. What would you say is the best around sports anchor comedy? I suppose I enjoy Twins, but that's more for the Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger material where they're working off each other. But Kindergarten Cop, is, whenever he's with the kids, is is pretty joyous. So Yeah, I agree. I'd say it's probably Kindergarten Cop. I might be that rebel and say last action hero, but we won't go into that here. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> it's not a great movie. I think it's a very interesting, weird movie that takes a lot more risks than, say, like a junior does. We all know Arnold sells the tough man role. What do you guys think of him as the comedic performer? Do you think it's equally as good a persona for him do you think it's maybe the lesser of two what do you think of him i have no problem with him being the comedic role uh when it works against type Mm -hmm. like like a kindergarten cop where he's the badass detective kimball but he's got to deal with these kids and he has no idea what he's doing or, or something like that uh but a movie like this where it's so against type i don't know that he has the acting chops to really pull it off and make it believable. There is no better than late 80s to early, early 90s Arnold action star. Uh, but I, I'm not against him playing comedic. Uh, I'm not against anybody taking the chances or going against type. I just don't know that this clearly wasn't the vehicle for him. Now, like Thomas alluded to with Last Action Hero, while I do not like that movie, I think he's phenomenal in it. He is totally taking the piss out of himself the whole movie. And I, I think it I think that's probably not his best comedic movie, but I do think that is his best performance. I would say that like Arnold usually works comedically when it is sort of more like a levity relieving moment at the same time. Because like the, the funniest thing Arnold's ever done is the bit in Terminator 2 with the smile. <laughs> like that's fucking amazing. That's just like such great, perfectly timed comedy. But I think it's it's kind of like when, um, you know, Steven Spielberg tried to do a comedy with 1941, even though it's like, oh, you did comedic moments in your movies before. But when you try and do full out comedy, it feels a bit more like you're forcing it, like you're straining it. And I think that's even the case in Junior, like the bigger slapsticky moments that do occasionally happen just feel a lot more kind of forced and even more just like lazy. It's like, oh, look, we'll have a gag like Arnold's pregnant and in a dress. Like, that's funny, right? That's all you need to just really laugh hysterically at what's going on when it just really isn't. And it's played so over the top seriously, including with like, there's that whole fucking montage of him at that women's retreat set to apparently the Academy Award nominated song. Look, look what love has done. (laughs) 
this movie's an Oscar nominated movie, everybody. <laughs> that was nominated for a fucking award? Keep in mind, this is the year where um, Elton John was nominated for three Lion King songs, so it's like we have to fill up spaces, I guess. Oh, God, was, did Randy Newman not put out anything that year? No, he was too busy writing the songs for Toy Story <laughs> the next year. <laughs> Could you imagine Randy Newman's song for this? He's pregnant. He's big and pregnant. Oh, God, why is Junior's an Academy Award nominated film? Yes. I think I'm done. My faith in film is just dead. <laughs> this feels like a bribe nomination. Like, Patty Smith really, like, just yeah. passed somebody a couple thousand dollars to get this fucking nominated. It's, it, it, it's such a saccharine, stupid song. If it's a saccharine, stupid movie, does anyone have anything else to actually say about Junior before we go into final thoughts? There was an odd bit, I thought, when Arnie goes to Emma Thompson, finding out he's been impregnated with her eggs. And essentially, it's her realizing against my will you've impregnated some of my eggs it's kind feels kind of horrific but then to follow it up with him saying to the guard who's trying to bundle him away my body my choice feels really <sighs> icky it's, it's, yes it's, yeah 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 i i completely agree with you yeah well, that, that's true in all the like maudlinness and the lack of comedy we did forget about the horrific implications about stealing someone's fucking embryos and then taking them as your own it's, it, it's like you mentioned the whole thing of like oh it's a man taking on this like pregnancy movie like stealing it from essentially a lady like even emma thompson like vaguely references that at some point it's additionally like oh and you also stole her leg her eggs against her will and impregnate yourself with it but then you're like on the phone, but I love you, Emma Thompson, the actress I have the most chemistry with of anyone I've ever <laughs> acted with. And then that's it. All it takes is love, man. Well, right, okay. to, for him to say that several times over the phone, and then she comes over like, hey, I'm going to fuck pregnant you, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. Do you have a private room? Because if someone's having my baby, I'll at least go to bed with them first. What? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, I, you know what? I'm not going to kink shame Emma Thompson. Whatever. It's your <laughs> oh, I get <laughs> If your thing is fucking pregnant, man, <laughs> I'm at it. I guess you're That's one a limited pool. <laughs> very, very limited. You know what I'm really into, guys? Big and pregnant Austrian male scientists. <laughs> Which, by the way, also, like, I love the fact that Arnold has, like, this prosthetic stomach, but is still totally jacked Arnold. Like, he couldn't commit to, like, oh, at all being like, oh, no, I'll have, like, some with a pregnant woman die. Like, nope. It just it makes it look even weirder. Just, like, it doesn't fit at all with the aesthetic whatsoever. It's really strange. Like, he's got this big, stupid belly, and he's wearing a muumuu. But his fucking traps and pecs and everything are just ripped. Yep. Like, he's still just... Excellent looking. He still looks the same as he does in True Lies, which came out this same year, just with a prosthetic stomach in front. Right, like he's wearing a fat suit. No, not even a fat suit, just a stomach. Right, yeah, he, yeah. Did, he didn't even commit to the fat suit. <laughs> didn't give him an extra chin, for God's sakes. Nope, no, not Arnold. Because it's his body, his choice. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Hey, come on. He had to talk about his sensitive nipples and say he got aroused by a honeydew melon. I mean, he had to have a win for himself. Well, we've all been there. That's another thing is like the quote unquote pregnancy symptoms that happen all just feel like they're supposed to be set up for like, oh, this could be like a setup of some kind of joke. Like he's saying he has sensitive nipples in public, but it leads to a weird discussion with other lab mates about like, do you surf? Or, oh, yeah, what laundry detergent do you use? And it's not a joke. That's not even an attempt at a joke. <laughs> No, uh, okay. I have a child. I was with my wife through her whole pregnancy. Right. None of the things Arnold does in this movie were exhibited during my wife's pregnancy. Not a one. Not, no, I got real sensitive. I have sensitive nipples and my sex drive is out of control. No, in fact, it was get the fuck away from me. I don't want anybody to look at me. You know, that type of shit. It was never there. Oh, yeah, let's have pasta and ribs and chicken wings and everything else that we can imagine that I could easily cook in an hour. What? Did she obsess over pigs and blankets at a party and then say, oh, going, going, always going, but never gone? But, like, is that a pregnancy symptom that you say playing oh. platitudes? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just, like, 
the, you know, well, I'm so alone and pregnant. No, it was get the fuck out. Go away. Go do something. <laughs> it was like, I don't want you, I don't want to be around anyone. That's what I went through. I don't know that that's the same for everyone. But, you know, Arnold's a different breed of pregnant man or woman or whatever. So maybe that's just that's just that's his journey. You know, I can't really take that away from him. Well, can you imagine the film of him shouting at Danny DeVille, get out? Yes, it should have happened. My yes, thing is, OK, I have a quick question while we're in final thoughts. Could you guys imagine this movie working with anyone else in it? Same everything. Different actor. Hmm. Like, honestly, would you, do you think it would work? Do you think it's Arnold's fault or just the movie script, everything as a whole? Well, I don't think if you cast someone else in the role, that I don't think it would have been a better film. But I don't think Arnie as the scientist, the muscular guy, the, I don't think he's... I think it's another role of tonight that his physical self doesn't really gel with what the role requires. And maybe if you had a more everyday kind of guy, it could have sold it a bit more, at least. Well, I think, like, what you would, in theory, kind of want to do for this is, like, have somebody who is, like, a ladies' man who probably, like, leaves women knocked up all the time to sort of be in the show, where it's, like, it feels almost like a comeuppance. So somebody who thinks, like, they're very suave and debonair kind of thing. And just, it's weird with, like, Arnold, despite how, like, obviously, like, physically fit he always was, I never would have considered, like any woman to like quite be attracted to him because he feels like just a greek statue come to life as opposed to a human <laughs> he looks like boris karloff's frankenstein i mean he's terrible <laughs> <laughs> well no, to be fair if frankenstein's monster like did not skip any day at the gym face not his not his physique no his physique you're right he 100 percent. he looks like fucking olympus <laughs> i just I, I don't i just don't think this movie with this script, would have worked with anybody in it. I, I really don't. I think it's just a completely misguided idea. <sighs> well, I guess I can't say it. The idea is there, but its execution is just all over the map. Like, if uh, I can, you know, it'd be great because he popped in there when I asked the question, like Mark Wahlberg, <laughs> the shooter role. Wow, I'm pregnant. Yeah, hey, I'm going to be a mother. <laughs> I'll say hello to myself for me. <laughs> 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 Those are great final thoughts, and I don't think you can top that. Um, no, <laughs> James, your final thoughts on Junior? I think it's, to call it an odd little film, is one hell of an understatement. It seems Ivan Reitman wanted to sell this as a cute little family film. Like, aw, Arnie's working with chimps. Aw, Arnie's pregnant. Aw, isn't this a laugh? No, it's a fucking icky little piece of horror. Get it away from me. Honestly, when I was in the lead up to this, I said to Thomas, please, I just don't want to watch Sabotage again. I would rather, rather watched it, to be honest. Damn. I, I hated Sabotage, I agree. That's that's uh, mm -hmm. one of my least favorite Arnold ones, for sure. Is that the fucking Sam Worthington one? Yes, the one with Sam Worthington yeah. and Joe Magnello, where they all play, like, bros that are in, like, the ATF oh, well, squad. Oh, yeah. And of course, they can all tattoo and shit. Oh, what garbage. Yeah, that's it's a lot of like really lame false machismo kind of bullshit. As opposed to with Junior, um, I would still say like as bad as I think that one is, Junior is like the absolute lowest thing for Schwarzenegger. I think because it's just the absolute meaning of like all the worst qualities. Like it is in diametric opposite to Total Recall, which makes it honestly a perfect choice for these two to like be played off each other because it's Arnold being just as like sort of sincere and attempting to be endearing, but it's in service of a terrible character surrounded by a bunch of other talents that are extremely wasted, especially Emma Thompson and Frank Langella, as mentioned previously. Um, and it, it feels so maudlin and so like very treacly in a way that it's not even like very silly funny. Like if you played Arnold, like, Oh, Arnold's pregnant and you just went ridiculous, silly comedy with it it would have been maybe something more in the line of, say, A Jingle All the Way, which is a bad movie, but I would watch any day over this fucking movie because there are at least, like, a few more joke-worthy moments in that fucking movie compared to this one. Uh, so there's a few more... That movie has Phil Hartman actually being funny. This one does not have any of that. Yeah, it gives it a win. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> this movie doesn't have him saying, oh, your wife's cookies are just the best. It, this does not have that whatsoever. Um, and it also feels like it's not just the start of the downturn for Arnold, but also for Ivan Reitman. Because this is coming off of like he had done Kindergarten Cop and Dave, which is a very underrated movie. Uh, with Kevin Klein impersonating the president, which Arnold has a cameo in, interestingly enough. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then mm. after after this, he would do Father's Day, Evolution, My Super Ex-Girlfriend. Oh, <laughs> like, yikes. Just a lot. And I, I think it just is a real testament to, like, I think he's been so much better as, like, a producer. Ivan Reitman was than he ever was as a director. As much of a classic as, like, a Ghostbusters is, that's one of those things where it's like all the right people were there at the right time, all doing their best work, and you can never quite achieve that again. <laughs> this is the worst Schwarzenegger ever offered us on the silver screen, as of yet. Well, on, on uh, that note, that's the end of our <laughs> discussion on our two very different films in the Arnold Schwarzenegger episode here, but we have some more Arnold to talk about because um, you all provide us feedback because every Monday we ask favor and least favor of whatever topic we're doing. And in this case, uh, we asked you about Arnold movies, of course. And uh, so first up from Chris Erke says, uh, Batman Robin definitely has to be on the worst list. The best, too many to list. Uh, Will Nix said, favorite commando, least favorite jingle all the way. Uh, Sean Vanderloo of the Roasted Robot Podcast, which is on the ESO Network, says uh, Terminator 2 for favorite, and least favorite is The Sixth Day. Uh, Jenny Walker says Twins or It Didn't Happen. Uh, Pauly W. says Junior, and Twins are the only bad ones. And then Carol Holden just asks a question of us, why do so many people hate Twins? Adam, why do so many people hate Twins? Because Twins is just 80s schlock. It, it's <laughs> cheesy, it's silly, it's... Arnold, before he even got even like a little bit of acting ability, which is not saying much. He's not a great actor, but he was really like rough around the edges in that one. It's a rough 80s buddy movie, but I still think Twins is charming. I want to put it on his near the bottom of the list for him. I mean, it's not my favorite, but it's not that bad. And, you know, I completely forgot about the fucking sixth of day. Good call. That is a mess of a film. Never saw that one. Th that's the one that he did, like, around the time of, like, End of Days, right? That's, like, late, late 90s. It, yeah, it came out, like, right after. It's, like, the sci-fi where he's a clone, or is he a clone, or whatever the shit. And it's it, it's the bad guy from Ghost is the bad guy in that. So there you go. <laughs> it's a terrible film. I'll take your word for it. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> Michael Rooker's in it. So you got that. Oh, he's never been in a bad movie. Good call. Can't wait. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think with Twins for me, like I rewatched it like a couple years ago because right before Genesis, I rewatched a bunch of Arnold movies. And Twins is fine. I think it's more, that's a case where that script doesn't make any sense because it's just like, people forget the plot of Twins is like, there's some kind of like thing that they steal from the hospital laboratory where they made Arnold and Danny DeVito that like their people are trying to steal and it's like a weird MacGuffin. It's such a bad like plotted movie, but the chemistry between him and Danny DeVito is great and you can't really like, yeah. it's totally watchable because oh, yeah. they, they play off each other so well. I don't think Kara needs to worry because the biggest twins defender seems to be Arnold himself. He's adores the role and Funny enough, he did an interview with Empire back in 2012, and anyone who visited him while he was in office, a dignitary of sorts, they, they got a bronze box filled with Arnold's 10 favorite films. You know, his all-time favorites like Lawrence of Arabia, Fantasia, Ben-Hur, but also in there, Terminator 2 and Twins. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Oh, Sis Cain and Last Temptation of Christ... And, you know, here is Jingle All the Way. And, like, get the fuck over here. I, I can appreciate that he loves the role, that he had a great time doing it. And he, he would love to revisit it. And there's still talks of the of the sequel with Eddie Murphy or whatever. The Which, God, no. Don't. Oh, don't. don't do it. Please don't. Especially when Eddie Murphy's on this like hot streak that he's apparently like almost building up now after the Dolomite movie. It's like, no, Eddie, don't do it. Yeah. You know, you're tempted. He's, he's, he's going to kill it with coming to America too. His hot history is going to go right downhill. 
I mean, well, no, that's uh, a... he could follow that up with twins then. But come, come on, that cum milkshake doesn't need an Eddie Murphy out of it. <laughs> that's a great description of it. A cum milkshake. Enjoy that one, kiddies. Oh god, that sounds even worse. Yeah, all the children that listen to this show. Oh, which by the way, I want to throw this out there real quick. My nephew Drake, who is just now thirteen, called me in class. They were supposed to listen to a podcast on the Podbean Network. <laughs> he listened personally to our Trick or Treat and Hood of Horror episode instead of listening to his schoolwork. So let's not do that again, Drake. But by the way, thanks for listening, buddy. Thanks for the download. We appreciate it. But uh, uh, stay in milk. Drink your school. <laughs> to quote Mr. T. Let's get back to Arnold, everybody. I, I would say of like the ones mentioned, you know, Batman and Robin gets a, literally a bad rap, you know, as much as it does. Um, it's not a good movie. But I think with time, that one has just become more of like, that's a bad example of a Batman movie as opposed to like one of the worst movies ever made. I think that reputation was really overblown at the time when we just didn't have a lot of Batman movies. And now it's just like, oh, it's just one example of a Batman and it's just like, it's a bad one, but not like a fucking like crime against humanity. Oh, it's, no, it's the worst one, though. That's the thing. Even now that we have as many Batman movies as we have, it's still the worst one. I would contend that Batman v Superman is a worse movie. Oh, I, I kind of have to disagree. I mean, uh, ooh, do I know? I don't know. God damn it. <laughs> but Ben Affleck was a better Batman than George Clooney. And at least in Batman v Superman, you got Wonder Woman. In Batman with Superman, in Batman and Robin, you got nothing. There's no moment as bad as the Martha bit to me in Batman v Superman than there is in Batman and Robin. Especially in the theatrical like version of Batman v Superman, it makes no sense. Like there is no logic to the storytelling whatsoever, and it's just like a fucking giant pretentious mess. That's the big thing too. I would argue that movie. It's a word I don't like to use, but it's extremely pretentious. As opposed to Batman and Robin, knows exactly what movie it is. It's like a lesser version of the Batman and Adam West show. It's a much lesser version, but at least it's aiming for something coherent compared to fucking Batman v Superman. I gotta say, I'm sorry, Adam, but I agree with Thomas here. I don't think Batman and Robin is a good representation of the character, but you know what? Neither is Batman v Superman, but at the very least, Batman and Robin, I can come out of it and not feel like someone's taken the character I love out the back and beating them over heads with a cricket bat or some shit. I guess I can't disagree with you guys, because if I had the choice, if they were both on at the same time, I'm going to watch Batman and Robin before or Batman or Superman. So I guess I got to agree. But to steer this back, um, maybe to Arnold, uh, were there any ones not mentioned here for either bad or good that you guys uh, want to spotlight amongst his filmography? I'd like to give a mention to Terminator Genesis, which I really do not like. It just feels like a desperate grab to get more attention for this franchise. And to be honest, I call it Terminator Genitals because it's complete and utter bollocks. Oh, it's garbage. It's garbage. You Mm -hmm. take the savior of humanity, the Christ figure, basically, from all the films, John Connor, and then like, oh, okay, we're just going to make him the bad guy because we got nothing else. What? What are you doing? It, that is an atrocious film. To me, that is the biggest, biggest misstep of the fucking franchise. I think that, that is just awful, awful shit. I can't, I can't agree with you more. I think that, what, just an insult. Uh, but I do want to throw out there, I, like we've already talked about, it, I love The Running Man. I love, love, love Predator. To me, that's mm-hmm. probably favorite of all time. I like True Lies for parts of it. I think Jamie Lee Curtis is really fun in it. And to throw back what we were talking about earlier, I'd say she's one of the more, you know, memorable, you know, female characters in a Arnold movie. For good or bad, you remember her. It's it's a very good performance, but I would argue, like, with age... It's a that... Well, yeah, no, no, I, I don't think it's no, so much the, like, the vapid character as much as... Like, they torture Jamie Lee Curtis in that movie and gaslight her constantly. It has not aged well. Like, the whole bit where, like, him and Tom Arnold are, like, interrogating her, it's awful. And Tom Arnold's just like, ladies, right? <laughs> they can't know, handle psychological torture. I will say that Bill Paxton, though, in oh, Two Lies. Yeah, is, yeah, that's uh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but um, he's so good when Arnold imaginarily kills him. It kills me every time. I would say that Arnold's probably 
from the era we discussed, the, you know, the mid eighties up to the mid nineties, there's not very many that you can look at and be like, well, well, but that one was really bad. Um, so he had a solid run. And as I've said before, Arnold is almost as identifiable as like Superman or Batman. You like, you show somebody in another country, the Superman symbol or the Batman symbol, they know exactly what it is. You say the word Arnold, people instantly know you're talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's how big of a star he was. And, you know, whether we are shitting on some of his bad movies or not, I mean, you can't deny the legacy the man has. No, yeah, and I would say, like, of that era that you're talking about, sort of during his peak, the worst one, I would say, is, like, Conan the Destroyer. But even that's another one that gets, like, conflated as so bad because it is a lesser movie than the original Conan, which is very underrated by a modern perspective. I feel like that oh, one's yeah, got absolutely. lost in the shuffle. It's such a great fucking turn from him, and it's such mm-hmm. an awesome, badass movie. Um, and then Conan the Destroyer... Hey, I'd say he is probably his most forgettable from that era. I have not seen that one, admittingly. So oh, there you go. Yeah, sure. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I of the ones I've seen, um oh no, we we did talk we talked about Red Sonia as well, I forgot. That's worse. Oh god. <laughs> oh that's really bad. That's not his fault though. No, no, and he's barely in it as well. But in terms of to with the destroyer, the destroyer is like a much more of like a family fantasy movie. Um, but I think there's fun bits in it. Like the whole finale thing with him in like the weird crystal mirror room with that stupid monster, I think is kind of fun. Like there's 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 charming bits in that movie, even though it's a much lesser follow up to Conan. Though at the same time, um, if Arnold's going to keep like doing the Sing Reaper prizes roles, I really would love for them to do King Conan. That's the perfect way to like close out his career. I think that's the one that is, I yeah. agree with you. If he's going to do it, that's the one that needs to happen. I think that could be potentially really kick ass. Uh, but eh, no, he seems to keep riding on the Terminator train. I mean, if, especially if you get, like, if you play it like Logan, but with Conan, it would be, like, a fucking perfect movie. <laughs> That's a really good idea. I like that. No, good, yeah. cool. And he's got to die at the end. He has to die yeah, at the end. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. It's the perfect way to, like, bow tie his career perfectly like that. It's just a hot take to throw out there. As much as I love James Earl Jones as um, Darth Vader, him mm. in Conan is, like, one of the great villain performances of that yeah. era. But especially in the opening. Okay, you see that boy? That is steel. That is power. <laughs> so oh, the cool. look on his face. The slow-mo, like, kind of... Oh, he's so good. Anyway, we want to thank all of you uh, for that feedback. We also want to thank Chris Oliver for the intro and outro music used in our show. Listen to more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Thanks to Emily Scarter for the art for our show. And, of course, thanks to Mr. James Rodriguez. James, what do you have to plug? Yes. Well, thank you very much. I am on Twitter and Instagram, if you would like to follow me, at RoddersJ04, spelled R-O-D-D-E-R-S. And I also do reviews on RoddersReviews.blogspot.com, where I have done, as of late, reviews or have reviews up of Official Secrets, which is a really compelling film about a real life story of Catherine Gunn which deserves to be more well known and on the lighter side Sean the Sheep sequel Farmageddon which is utterly lovable and adoration to science fiction hopefully I'll have one of Dr. Sleep by the time this uh, podcast episode comes out we'll see what happens and I am also going to be recording an episode of Have Not Seen This with past guest Rafe Telsh where I'll be discussing the Taika Waititi film, Boy. Oh, wow. That, 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 that's a deep cut right there. That's his first movie. Yeah, oh, shit. Actually, it's his <laughs> second film. Oh, that's right, because he did Eagle vs. Shark first. Mm. Right. Yeah, I, I forget that one as well. It's... Nerd fight! <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that all sounds very lovely, James. Thank you for coming on once again, gracing us with the British accent. Um, it really classes up the show. Mm-hmm. Even when you say things like a cum milkshake. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, if you want more classy content like that, just uh, make sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at DEDVPod. That's where you post up those feelers every Monday. And you can also uh, send us 
uh, feedback via the old traditional email way at uh, doubleedgedoublebill at gmail.com, all spelled out. And you can follow my own individual Twitter account at Not the Who's Tommy, uh, where I post my musings and such. I also do writing at uh, marianitomas.wordpress.com uh, for reviews and stuff. I probably will have a Terminator Dark Fate review up here. Yeah, and I also do some satirical superhero writing at uh, truesuperherofans.com. And uh, Adam, you got some things to promote, don't you, over there? I, I do, which is wild. But um, no, I've been doing some uh, art for sale. I've been doing pumpkins and custom made. They're forever pumpkins, so they'll last you forever in any pop culture thing. If you want to get on that, it's facebook.com slash ghoulish gourds, all one word. I'm actually going to be starting doing Christmas bulbs here in the next week or two. Uh, so right time for the Christmas season and also, uh, either right around the time this releases or maybe even before I'm going to be on past guest Desmond, uh, Peel Alexander's podcast, uh, Desmond's flicks discussing, uh, rape revenge films, which is going to be really fun, especially for the kids. Gather them around. All the children who listen to this show. Get, going get, to the kids, get the kids, wake them up, wake them up out of bed and, uh, Make them listen to us talk about Miss 45 and I spit on your grave. If you shoot me a message, if you go on and you want to buy something from Ghoulish Gord, shoot me a message. Say you heard this on the show and I'll cut you at least five dollars off. Yes. And also, if you're like, say, not on Facebook uh, because it's a hellscape and you want to promote it and you want to like ask for it, say, via our Twitter account at DEDB pod, I'll pass the message along to Adam because he doesn't dare go to Twitter. I will choose to ignore it, though. Ignore all that legal tender. Yep. <laughs> I'll just no, yeah, that. but anybody who wants hold of us, you can find us somewhere. Uh, you know, it just send us an email and uh, let us know, and I'll, I'll hook you up. Yes. And I should mention, by the way, um, I technically was a guest recently on um, the Needless Things podcast uh, because they uh, released out the audio from way back in September, the Dragon Con track um, episode panel that we did about the Scooby-Doo 50th anniversary, the horror of Scooby-Doo that just was uh, put out there on the Needless Things podcast feed. So uh, listen to that. And of course, you can also just uh, make sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, any other pl- podcast platforms out there. And if you're listening on the ESO network, why not dig into the archives for our first several episodes on our Podbean feed and uh, make sure to rate, review, or at least just share the show around to give us some more visibility. So we've reached the end of the show, and as per usual, it is time to do our picking for next week. And if you're new to the show, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, each of us have um, two movies of different quality, Adam and I, um, and we're going to randomly select a good and bad feature for our next topic, which in honor of the Roland Emmerich Pearl Harbor movie Midway, we are going to do war movies, which um, is a topic, obviously, we've never done before, and... um, it was very interesting, especially because, uh, Adam, you have the two good picks, and obviously there are plenty of great war films in cinema. Sure, sure. For sure. Um, it was really hard for me with bad picks, especially considering it's like, well, is it bad because it's historically inaccurate? Is it bad because of cinematography and other things? Here, bad right, right, right. Right, right. And, and also, uh, most of them are at least two hours long. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, easy. You know, this is one of the hardest ones I had to pick for even for good. Because I know it sounds bad, but I didn't want to pick one that I really like that's not historically accurate, and maybe even offend somebody or a veteran or something like that. This was a very tricky one for me, and I pushed for this topic, and it it was kind of hard for me. So what you're saying is war, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Abs- absolutely nothing. Say it again. No, this was a very difficult one for me. I I, I tried to bring in a little bit of sensitivity to it. And then I woke up and realized, what the fuck do I care? And I just picked two movies I like. Well, uh, we'll definitely be testing ourselves next week with this episode. But, uh, you know, usually each of us would do a number between 1 and 10 in order to pick the others, two movies we've assigned numbers between 1 and 10 for. Uh, but James is our guest, so he gets to uh, go ahead and shoot and uh, get our two movies. Uh, so for Adam's two good picks, number between mm-hmm. 1 and 10, James. Okay, in honor of Total Recall, and uh, two weeks, two weeks, you get number two. At number two on the dot, I have Platoon, starring Charlie Sheen, Tom Berenger, Johnny Depp, uh, Forrest Whitaker, Adam Baldwin, and 
Oh, John C. McGinley and everybody else you could possibly think of. All right, yeah, that's a great movie. It's, it's been a while since I've seen it, too. Uh, yeah, it's uh, one of Oliver Stone's best. And number nine, I had one who was not uh, the backdrop of the movie is War, but I had Three Kings. Okay, yeah, that's a very, that's one that's gotten kind of lost to time. I really like that one. Yeah, yeah. I agree. It's a very, very good movie. Yes. And now for my two bad picks, James. Okay, in honor of Junior and Arnie being up the duff for nine months, you get number nine. At number eight. I had uh, a movie I've never seen before, but I've, it was the most consistent one on, like, lists of, like, worst war movies that was there all the time. Um, I have the Al Pacino vehicle, Revolution. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I have seen this. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> oh, shit. You know how we always talk about how this movie is pro- might be in our top five with our bad movies? You know, Hood of Horror, this is probably one of the worst five we've watched so far. Revolution's going to be right up there. Well, that's what I've heard. It, it lives up to bad reputation, I guess. Um, but uh, then at number three, I had Steven Spielberg's 1941. That, well, you know, that's pretty bad. But it's It's a bad one, but I would say there are weird nuggets of interesting stuff in it. I think yeah. particularly just that's another one where like the cast is bizarre. Where it's like it's one of the few John Belushi movies. Dan Aykroyd and John Candy are in it. Ro- uh, fucking uh, Robert Stack's in it. Thank you for not picking Pearl Harbor, by the way. No, because that that's a, that was one that was like three hours long. As opposed to both of these are at least under three hours. Um, but it's always interesting. We're going with the Revolutionary War and v- Vietnam. That's that's a very diverse. <laughs> It's gonna, it's gonna be interesting. Okay, it's gonna be a rough one probably to make jokes about. Yes, this is a fun topic. We're all gonna love it. <laughs> hey, well, because our stupid, pasty, pudgy asses have never been in the war. Been in the war of my mind. What are you talking about? We just we just watched Junior. We know combat. We know the horrors. We're gonna have PTSD for ages because of this. That is true. Junior's in the trees, man. Junior's in the trees. You weren't there, man. You weren't there. You didn't see Arnold's baby. I thought it was a chicken, but it was the baby. Junior don't surf. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. We, we really got to end this. Thank you, James. Good night, everybody. I'll be back. Hope you enjoyed the ride. <laughs> has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.